Sometimes we get criticized. Are oh, you building United Front? This is popular front. The shortcut is a party and all. Let me just tell you, I've been around for I'm, old, I'm younger, but I've been around for a long time. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts and no cut and paste solutions. The only thing is that workers must mobilize. They must fight, and when they fight, as I mean, let me just say, as Lenin says. You can, you can sit here and run a workshop about the relationship between the state and the bourgeoisie. But the most impact of the relationship between the state and the police is when the police come and break a strike. For the workers, it becomes clear which side the police stand in. Hundreds of workshops are important, but they cannot replace that experiential learning. And therefore, the question of struggle for us is important and fundamental. Talk, talk, many papers, producing programs, too important, but it cannot replace the real world. Real world. Okay. The, last, uh, the last one was the, 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 the question. I know where uh, this uh, is, I saw some comrades uh, with the Spartacist uh, newspaper. We do have them at home, the spots. <laughs> uh, we have a, I can see the workers rendered here, and there's a big debate about the spots. Kick the police out of the unions. <coughs> this is that, uh, you know, the spots and the CLI. We do have a police union uh, uh, organized. It's one of the unions that kicked out NUMSA. It's a part of the five big unions in South Africa. We also have a union of soldiers, defense force. We went to court to fight that soldiers are workers, and we won them. <laughs> now, I don't want to get into a big political discussion. Our view is quite simple. And this is what we said with police brutality. As we're having a campaign, we had a, a campaign. On the posters to the consulate, our message was say that uh, up to now, the U.S. guns have been killing people all over the world. Now they are killing their youth. For us, the message was uh, simple. You police, don't turn your guns on striking workers because you have problems yourselves. Turn the guns on our enemies. <laughs> and what we're saying is that when it comes to the issue, I mean, and this may not be an immediate issue, when it comes to the crunch in any revolution, the question on which side, and this is not me now being sexist, Lenin said, the question of where that body of armed men will stand, which side will they be, is important. And therefore, the political work in the army and the police was important. We formed Bob Crew. We formed the police union. We formed the defense union against the thing that they shouldn't unionize. And we brought them into Kosovo. 
The fact that, I can see you shaking your head, the fact that uh, they've now become on the other side, including the other unions that have dismissed NUMSA, our position is clear. Our fight is not with the ordinary workers uh, of those unions who dismissed us. Those are our class brothers and sisters. We've got to reach to them. Our fight is with the bureaucrats yes. who said as 31 people and expel 360,000 workers. And at every opportunity, we want to reach them. And, and it is the same with the, the question of the, of, the, of, of, of the police union. The civil servants now have just said they were demanding 15% increase. They've settled at 7%. A betrayal by their leaders. Since they started their fight, although they've expelled us, we've supported their fight. When they march, we march with them. Because the idea is to win them over. I think maybe let me say amen for this round. Okay, Richard. I'm John. Oh, well, I, well, I was saying Richard. That's okay. We'll go with you, John, and oh, then Richard. Sorry. Okay. So, um, I have two quite different yeah, issues that I'd like too. to raise. And the first one, and uh, for your for your comments and thoughts, uh, comment. The first one is, you know, we're all internationalists here, or else we wouldn't be here. But as for myself. It's not just out of uh, uh, some kind of moral values, but what can we learn from struggles in other parts of the world to apply here to our struggle? And to me, there's two ways in which NUMSA has set an example for us. And the first is, here, all too often, we will see union leaders who will take a good position on, let's say, Israel, or the police murdering black youth, or whatever issue, uh, uh, fracking is another big one. And then they turn around and support the very same politicians here that are instituting those policies. And to me, there's a, it's, it, it's like a psychotic break there. You know, and we cannot accept that. And the other point is, what I thought was very important to hear from, from the comrade and, and from the video there about NOMSA, that it is really serious about fighting on the shop floor. Because that's the other thing, is here in this country, these same union leaders who might take these good positions, and then they turn around and they shove rotten contracts down our throats, and every day they're in there, you know, uh, hobnobbing with the boss and playing golf with them a couple times a year and that sort of thing. <laughs> so you, you, you can't, it, it has to be either one or the other. And I would like to be very interested in hearing the comrades' uh, uh, comra uh, comments on that, including, I hope, that, you know, on the United States, because it's always good for us to get an outside view. The other question I have is on this question of a tax on immigrant workers, which is something we've seen all around the world, and I've read some articles, uh, read some news reports about that happening in South Africa. And I'm wondering if you see a threat of that developing on a wider scale to cut across and that might uh, tend to cut across what you were trying to build as far as a workers' party and that sort of thing. Um, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I was glad to hear that you were saying that the movement towards socialism is an electoral party and that that is separate from the United Front. But I was wondering if you could explain further what is the basis of uh, unity for this United Front that NOMSA is organizing? And what are the different component uh, bodies inside the United Front? Thanks. Okay, and we're gonna add Andre and... Um, I was curious, uh, it seemed like the union you spoke of has split. Uh, so I was curious, did it split because of the workers? have different opinions or because of your laws and your land. Um, and then, too, um, I was hearing that you separated yourself from your government, as I, I know it, as instead of um, so, sort of like ourselves, we separated ourselves from the AFL-CIO. That's not our government, but that's an association that we was a membership of. 
So are you trying to create a new government um, in the process uh, along with um, I've heard from the videos and stuff, it's like some of the things um, you aim towards, uh, you say socialism, but you aim towards nationalism. So I'm kind of conflicted of what it is that you really aim it towards. All right, let's do the details. Next round. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me start with Andre. Uh, Andre, let's say, uh, I, I, I think uh, if I uh, uh, maybe, let me start about uh, the point about socialism and and uh, nationalism. Uh, our, our viewpoint as a union is that, uh, and this is from when we were formed. NUMSA goes back to 1973 and it is a was a result of a spontaneous uprising of workers in Devon who said no more. And these metal workers were formed around the country and they merged to form a national union of metal workers in 1987. But our roots go back to 73. And when we were formed in 1987, May 22nd, we couldn't in the constitution say that we are socialists because under apartheid, any uh, feathering of communism was illegal. You could go to jail. So we had to find a clever way of saying that we are socialists. <laughs> And our view was very clear that the absence of political rights and the struggle to win political rights in South Africa cannot be won from ending economic exploitation. The absence of democracy and the economic exploitation, which is like capitalism, were two sides of the bloody same coin. And when we uh, put uh, our, our logo, we sent them to the registrar, which is the government, and the registrar saw the red star, and said, oh, no, 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 this is communism. <laughs> so what we did was to take the map of Africa, put it in front, and the star was behind. <laughs> And the stupid registrar thought, okay, that's not communism. <laughs> <laughs> but after the unbanning and the, the, the scrapping of the Suppression of Communism Act, we brought the, the red star forward. <laughs> so the union has, uh, uh, has always believed that the solution is socialism. It's, it's a different economic system. The system where few people own private property is, is, is not the solution. Mm -hmm. So we believe in that and we believe in workers' control of production, mm -hmm. planning, that, so, socialism, socialism. Now, I think what uh, maybe we, we didn't, uh, uh, or maybe, maybe, is that in that uh, the General Secretary of the Union was talking about nationalization. Yeah. And by nationalization, you meant that, uh, that you see, in South Africa, 90% of platinum, I'm just making it up, the deposits are in South Africa. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have all these cars I see here with catalytic converters. Right. You get the platinum from us. Mm -hmm. yeah. But those are owned by multinational corporations. Right. And the worst part, is that while you put a catalytic converter in a car that goes to the U.S. and the Western Europe, the car that gets sold in South Africa doesn't have to have a catalytic converter. <laughs> it pollutes the air. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. So basically what the argument has been is that uh, 
we must take over what we call the strategic minerals so that they don't belong to individuals. Right. That's what nationalization is. Okay. And that we should do that nationalization not in the same way that it was done before. It should be done under workers' control. Because yeah. we do have a state ownership. And state ownership and without workers' control will lead to what we have with ESCO. That's the electricity utility. Yeah. It's owned by the state. The bureaucrats uh, get people on the board. Right. They do their own thing and all of that. So what uh, Comrade uh, Ivan Jim was talking about was the question of... And the ANC in 1955, when it adopted the Freedom Charter, had put this as a central plank of its policy that it will nationalize when it comes into office. And then when it came into 1990, and then we had big English, and we had case by case, as evidence would show, and all of it. And our view is that uh, when we say that nationalization, it means that we've got to go back to that policy under present circumstances, under workers' control, under public and democratic control. I think that's that's the nationalization that the Congress was talking about. Yeah. Um, the thing about uh, we are we what are we doing? Uh, there is a what I call a de facto split in COSAT, which is in the unions, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. But our union is calling that for a split from the ANC. The ANC is the ruling part. It is the governing part. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, I don't know the, the complicated, the Republicans, the Democrats, but it, it rules the country. And it has a 62% majority in the last election. And since 1990, the unions have been in a formal alliance with the ANC, meaning we support the ANC, we go out to canvass uh, 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 people to vote for the ANC. There's a slogan that uh, we must, the working class must swallow that uh, must swell the ranks of the ANC, meaning it must mm -hmm. make the ANC working class. Our members said, hey, man, we've been trying to swell this thing. We've become swallowed in it, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no point of going back. Because the way the ANC has become, it's become very undemocratic. It doesn't function as a democratic organization. But also, many of the people who fought uh, for liberation have become big shareholders in multinational corporations. There's something in South Africa called black economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. Take Stacey, 